And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the very popular, busy intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck, your host here at the Mothership in Irondale, Alabama, where Mother Angelica began it all back in 1981. And don't forget the show only goes forward because you email us questions, you check us out on Facebook and send us questions, you tweet us on Twitter. And also, if you want some additional information on Father Spitzer, go to the Magis Center website, of course, and also CredibleCatholic.com, which is what we're working through, finishing off our show topic today, which seems to be uh, an eternal question and maybe a very popular question for today. Where have we come from and where are we going? I think there's a lot of people probably out there uh, scratching their head in general in life and even in the church with that question. The book of the month, Cardinal Mark Wallets. Friends of the Bridegroom for Renewal Vision, Renewed Vision of Priestly Celibacy. I had the pleasure of interviewing the Cardinal. It's a wonderful book and a timely one when the question of celibacy is very much on the minds of many people, many Catholics around the world. With that being the case, we turn to the answer man, Mr. Universe himself, Father Robert Spitzer, out in <laughs> Orange County, California at Christ Cathedral. Great to see you again. Oh, great to be with you, Doug. And wow, Mr. Universe, uh, nobody ever accused me of that. <laughs> well, it's your universe, so you're the Mr. In you're the maybe your father universe. Maybe I made a mistake. <laughs> uh, better begin so, with a prayer. prayer. Absolutely. <laughs> in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless our church at this time and guide us uh, with your Holy Spirit. We call upon the whole communion of saints to really give us inspiration, guidance, protection, so that uh, we might truly follow and do your will. Ask you to bless Doug and myself, our whole audience this day, with your Holy Spirit inspiring and guiding us. And we ask you, Lord, that uh, you bring everything we do and say to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we're going to be talking about our topic, of course, like I said, kind of where we've come from and where we're going as we finish up the section on the church itself. We'll get to that and talk about the idea of the need for faith, but we have some other questions. Before I get into one, this kind of relates to the first question coming up, but I noticed that uh, you had done something recently talking about the Pew study and talking about uh, in mm -hmm. relation to information about millennials, which is not the most positive. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, this brand new Pew survey just came out uh, validating that over 40 percent of our young people are not only leaving the church, they're leaving faith in God altogether. Mm -hmm. I've been talking about this for quite a while. It, it certainly, again, reflects what uh, Pew discovered in 2012 and 2016. And so um, it is still continuing to happen apace. But what's interesting about uh, this uh, survey is that it uh, more or less correlates mm -hmm. with two other surveys that have been done. Uh, one of them is coming from the National Center of Disease Control, and this is a comprehensive survey on the number of suicides um, among our young people. Right, this would right. be not only among millennials, but Generation Z. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's gone up 51% in 15 years. I mean, that's unimaginable. 51% in 15 years. And the rate of depression mm -hmm. among millennials and young people, according to the Columbia University study, has gone up 46%. Now, let's just take a look at this for just one second and see it in light of another study. And, and uh, first of all, you can t see just correlatively, mm -hmm. you can see that as the decline of religion has occurred, remember a 40% decline uh, in religion, not just religion, but people leaving religious practice and faith altogether, mm -hmm. we notice that there's a 51% increase and a 46% increase in suicides and depression respectively. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a correlation between suicides and depression on the one hand and the decline of religion on the other. And this, in turn, corresponds to a study that was done in 2004 uh, by the American Psychiatric Association.
Association mm -hmm. or published in the American Psychiatric Association Journal by Kanita Dervik and uh, a, a group of uh, other psychiatrists. And in that study, they found significant increases, like large increases uh, mm -hmm. in um, depression, impulsivity, aggressivity, substance abuse, mm -hmm. familial tensions, and suicides mm -hmm. when you look at non-religiously affiliated people compared to religiously affiliated people. In other words, non-religiously affiliated people had significantly higher rates mm -hmm. of depression, uh, impulsivity, aggressivity, substance abuse, familial tensions, and suicides. And, and now we're seeing it writ large mm -hmm. in the millennials and Generation Z. Uh, all I can say is we have to stop it. And, and the number one reason given by millennials for why they're leaving, in other words, 50% of that 40%, that, that's 20% of the total millennial and Generation Z population, are leaving because they see no evidence for God or they see a contradiction mm -hmm. between faith and science. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what I would recommend and the reason we have this whole Credible Catholic website uh, right. that we've been going through is please go to CredibleCatholic.com. If you know young people who are struggling with these questions, if you know a young person who's saying, well, who caused God? This is a nonsensical question. You can prove it's a nonsensical question. Don't mm -hmm. say to your kid, it's a mystery. Say this question can be answered. It's a very good question you're asking, but it really is a, a contradictory question. You're saying, what caused the uncaused cause? And, and you can actually mm -hmm. show that. And, and so go to CredibleCatholic.com, click on the seven essential mm -hmm. modules and and have your child watch with you right it's there's you, there's these these 35 minute videos mm -hmm. with embedded videos inside them just watch uh, uh, them with your child the first five of those videos just to give them the answer to these very common questions but don't say it's a mystery don't say nobody knows the answers to these questions mm -hmm. people know the answers to these questions it's not really a mystery these are good questions they can be answered and, and we want to give our kids a real fighting chance before right. they go to college otherwise they're just going to leave well, and, and yeah. so uh, if, and that's yeah. the confusing part uh, you, uh, in a sense you're saying it's clear that as people leave the church or leave their faith behind, the likelihood of mm -hmm. depression and suicide go up. So you would think but tremendously. So yeah. you would think the antidote to this the suicide and problem would be to hold on to your faith or stay more deeply in your faith. So I mean, is is it nobody's making the case to show people that there's a cause and effect there, or is it that people just are not seeing? Christianity lived out in any given way today? Well, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I guess it's both, uh, Doug. I think a lot of people are just not making the case uh, very well. Mm -hmm. And if they do see the correlation, gee, it's not just that my kid's salvation is jeopardized, like mm -hmm. that's not serious enough, right? I mean, but of course, you, you know, as your child becomes non-religiously affiliated, he's opening himself to the dark side. He's opening himself uh, to, the, to, to the evil spirit. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, he's becoming more and more distant from God. But he's also, we know this is a correlation. That child is going to start experiencing deep emptiness, alienation, loneliness, and guilt mm -hmm. on a cosmic level. I mean, they're, they're going to have a, a, a really deep-seated fe feeling of darkness. Mm -hmm. and, and not only that, but the evil spirit's going to come in there and, and try and give some false consolations to sort of, uh, you know, allow him to move or her into, the, allow them to move into the darkness a little bit more deeply. And, and as they do that, the, mm -hmm. the, the emptiness, the loneliness, the alienation, becomes even deeper and, 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 and more profound, mm -hmm. at which point the depression level skyrockets, the suicide uh, ideations just skyrocket, mm -hmm. and, and you've got trouble, you know, psychologically, you have trouble from the vantage point of, mm -hmm. of interpersonal relationships, and above all, mm -hmm. you've got trouble with respect to salvation and, and getting right. to that heavenly kingdom that we want so much for our, ki our kids. We have to give them the answers to their questions, but we also have to tell them, just talk turkey with them. Mm -hmm. You know the best way of preventing this depression, th these, these feelings that you're having of emptiness and loneliness and alienation, is to come back into connection with God. Mm -hmm. Saying to God, 
best and was right. Just insist on it. God has made you for himself and your heart will be restless until you rest in him. Mm -hmm. Start going to church. Start taking your religion seriously. The depression's going to lift. The emptiness is going to lift. The alienation's going to lift because God really is doing the lifting. Mm -hmm. You're not having an optimistic feeling. You can't <laughs> talk your way out of depression. You're going to have to get some grace to, to help you out of that depression. And the reality of God is that the more you practice your religion and prayer, mm -hmm. the more you get lifted out of that emptiness and loneliness. The more you go to confession, the more you get lifted out of that emptiness and, lo uh, and loneliness. Mm -hmm. The more you practice your faith, the more you're going to be lifted out of what you consider to be a malaise, a worthlessness uh, about life. Mm -hmm. and, and the more, in turn, you will be not just j happy, but joy filled in the sense of being on the road to salvation. Even if you have challenges in life, even mm -hmm. if you have suffering in life, still you're going to be on the road with a, a, a much better frame of right. mind like the saints. Well, it strikes me, uh, one of the points you made in, in just talking there was about the idea of salvation. And I think in a lot of times in, in societies where, you know, you're living a life where you where the, you know, the idea that you could die at any time if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not out making sure there's food, you know, you're focused mm -hmm. on this, I need to do this or these bad things can happen. You know, same thing, living right. your life in a certain way and knowing part of the thing is I, I want to be saved and there's a chance I can't, I won't be saved. But in the world today, in the church today, certainly, the number of people talking mm -hmm. who say uh, that the, uh, the broad road isn't filled with people who are going to heaven and the narrow road is the people who might be on the wrong path, which is the opposite of mm -hmm. obviously what our Lord said. So the idea, mm -hmm. the thinking that it matters that much, I mean, does it really matter that mm -hmm. much? And sometimes I think people in an attempt to make be welcoming and everything else, water it down so much that people ultimately, mm -hmm. rather than saying, oh, go, that's easy, they say, well, gee, I guess God is all merciful. He, he understands I'm basically a good person. He'll take care of me. Yeah, well, here's, you know, the, the answer lies in, in both fact. God is all merciful and he wants to save us. But we also are created as free agents. And, and, and so you have to cooperate with the grace that God wants to give you, the forgiveness that God wants to give you. You have to also solidify yourself against the evil spirit. I, I hate to say this to people, but the, the devil is very real. Mm -hmm. the, the devil is very convincing and persuasive. The devil will bring you along that road to darkness and you'll just think life couldn't be better until he pulls that rug out from under you mm -hmm. and the deep and alienation as, as, as Jesus says the darkness will mm -hmm. soon come and when it does come you're not going to know how to get out of there you're going to feel so lonely and alienated from God so distant from God you, 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 you may not you may well not turn to him Mm -hmm. And so uh, right then the devil's going to come to you and start the accusing game. Right then he's going to try and give you a rolling shoulder block so that you're, you're never going to you know, be able to turn around and, and get off that road. And, and so the, the main thing is stay on the road with, with God. Don't get on the road uh, to, to, to darkness mm -hmm. because darkness is not just seductive but darkness can pull you into itself so deeply, mm -hmm. you don't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I've just seen you know, some cases you know, where you know, in, in an exorcism, you, you, you have to cooperate you know, with the exorcist, the person who's, who's, who's possessed has to cooperate with the exorcist. And, and, and they almost, at, at some point, um, you know, there's so much, you know, they've gone down the dark road so much that, that uh, they quit the exorcism. They, they mm -hmm. don't want to do it. I mean, uh, this high priestess, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, the, who was in a satanic uh, cult, mm -hmm. um, you know, who was being exorcised, and this is a, a case that I read in the New Oxford Review mm -hmm. uh, by Dr. Richard Gallagher. Um, the, but basically, um, she quit the exorcism uh, after a while. She never came back mm -hmm. because... Um, uh, she w had been so far down the road, uh, she really couldn't give up. But you know that that uh, 
uh, seduction to the mm -hmm. darkness and uh, ultimately it overcame her. So you just don't want to go down that road. You just have to recognize how seductive it is. Mm -hmm. You just have to recognize how, how the, the devil can, can absolutely put pitfalls in, in your place. And you are free. You are free. That mm -hmm. is the fact. I mean, it's the best thing that ever happened to us. And of course, if you look at it from the opposite way around, it could mm -hmm. be the worst thing that ever happened to you because you could choose to cooperate with evil over God. And so we have to make that choice every day to stay on the road. Right. We have to make that choice every day to try and stay obedient. We have to make that choice every day to want to, you know, connect with the Lord and, and, and derive his strength. Mm -hmm. we, we have to make that choice every day so there it is I mean there right. there there we go I mean uh, I mean it, it, but if we do right. God will help us right. but don't go down the road too far because if you do you may find yourself uh, you know choosing mm -hmm. what 22 years ago you would have never done right because you uh, are already right. uh, put into a position uh, or you put yourself into a position of being so seduced down mm -hmm. that road and so uh, guilty for having right. done it as the, the devil gets out his accusation role. And, and so you, you uh, are playing with fire, right. literally playing with fire. Right. Also, I, I remember, I think recently in the, in the Pew study, I thought something struck me because a lot of, we've heard in the United States, obviously, and obviously we just had the Amazon Synod, which was focused on, let's mm -hmm. say, South America, Latin America, and obviously we've had a lot of immigration and a lot of Spanish-speaking people from South America have come into the United mm -hmm. States, and a lot of times people will say, well, the future of the church in many ways is going to be Hispanic, which is the largest mm -hmm. growing number. But I'm pretty sure there mm -hmm. was, a, in the Pew study, it showed a high percentage of Hispanics who came to the United States as Catholics who ended up leaving. Yeah. No, I mean, there's, again, uh, the seduction, although luckily, uh, a good number are staying, but a good number are leaving. And so, we, uh, um, you know, we have to work overtime at, at that population, too. And uh, we've just done, you know, what I was just, that resource I was just talking about, mm -hmm. CredibleCatholic.com, and you go to the seven essential modules. We have done a Spanish uh, translation of it because uh, the Hispanic kids are going to go through it just like, uh, right. um, um, you know, the the, the U.S. citizens, uh, the, uh, uh, the the Anglo-speaking and uh, English-speaking uh, kids have gone through it, and just like the Europeans have already gone through it. I right. mean, they're 15 years ahead of the our, our curve in terms of of leaving, and so uh, we really have to have a ministry to stop the hemorrhaging on all levels. Mm -hmm. And we are hemorrhaging on all levels. And it, it's, it's not good enough just to be open. Mm -hmm. We better have the answers to these kids' questions because they're asking good questions. Mm -hmm. We do have the answers to them. They're there on CredibleCatholic.com, right. that, you know, on the seven essential modules. And, and I'm just begging. We, we are going to start, by the way, uh, a landing page fairly quickly. Oh, good. Uh, called, the, it's called, the, it's for parents. It's the 40 most asked questions of parents by their children. Mm -hmm. Just like who caused God or, you know, things like that, where the parent always goes, well, this is a mystery or something. Or some, you know, the child just there's no evidence for God from science and the parent says well there shouldn't be you know <laughs> and and uh, you know or God and, and, and science are contradictory you know and the parents go well I'm, I know there's an answer to this but I don't know what it is right so we have to give parents a real tool here that'll help them out because uh, unfortunately a lot of them just have not you know the church has not been into apologetics uh, for quite some time and mm -hmm. so uh, uh, we're hoping that this landing page will, will help out uh, to bring some apologetics really right. back into it but well, we want the resource to be known and so uh, right. we, we haven't finished the, that landing page yet but okay. again it, it, we need catechesis in all levels parents right. well the, the atheists kids, seem to be pretty good at apologetics these days so Oh man, <laughs> I mean they're 15 years ahead of us too. I mean we, 
we we were slow to catch up uh, I, I have to say but uh, we, we are catching up right and we've got much better answers right and quite frankly you know th we should take solace in the fact that mm -hmm. you know 51 percent of scientists are theists we should take solace in the fact that 88 percent of physicians are religiously affiliated so you know science is not contradicting um, you know uh, uh, God right. for those who are scientists and doctors but they are for the uh, you know for the the new atheists who are making this pretentious and false claim. Right. Now, here's a question somebody sent us that kind of ties into the Pew research that came out. Mm -hmm. in regard, and, we, and this is something we talked a little bit about before. I said, Dear Father Spitzer, in regards to the Pew research poll that found that only one third of U.S. Catholics believe in transubstantiation, are there any yeah. specific mm -hmm. causes that have led to this massive disconnect? How can this misunderstanding be fixed? This is Andrew from Spokane. Yeah, Andrew, I, I think there are three areas that um, have caused this to happen. Um, the first uh, cause is really a lack of catechesis. Um, that is to say, people just have not been taught clearly about this. Uh, I don't think catechism classes went through John, the Gospel of John chapter 6 very, very assiduously. I mean, you, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I, I cannot go through uh, John chapter that. six and come out thinking, you know, that, <laughs> you know, how can you not believe that that, you know, Jesus intended that the Eucharist be real if you read that chapter? I mean, I I, I don't see how that's possible. Mm -hmm. Moreover. Everything that I've talked about in previous programs, where I uh, literally talked mm -hmm. about this double collapse of time and what Jesus intended in the Holy Eucharist, etc., that's never been taught uh, to, to people. So mm -hmm. I don't think they have a proper um, catechesis. But secondly, they don't have proper apologetics. They don't know how to understand uh, the real presence of Christ in uh, John chapter 6. They don't know how to understand what Jesus intended at the Holy Eucharist because they think our notion of time is Jesus' notion of time, which it isn't. Jesus has a sacred notion of time mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, you know, where he views all time in the mind of God as completely manipulable, and it is. I mean, mm -hmm. Jesus is absolutely right, of course, but the point mm -hmm. I'm trying to get to is we don't understand what Jesus was even thinking. So the, the, the point is is the, the apologetics has, has simply not been done. And on the third level, I, I have to tell you, when people go into the church, there's the sacra sacrament there in the tabernacle, and, and people are, they're not acting as if they're in the presence of God. And, Absolutely. you know, it, 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 it's right. almost like a, a, a you know, a, a meeting hall. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, the reverence mm -hmm. has been lost. I see it coming back. Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, you know, at the uh, focus conferences or amazing parish conferences, they, they have the adoration, you know, and, and, and of the sacrament that, you know, we can see at the Napa Institute conferences, right, that, that the processions and the adoration, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's coming back. Right. Um, the, the reverence is starting to come back in a lot of parishes where uh, priests are actually asking people, please, you know, as you go into the church, you know, be reverent. I mean, if you want to have conversations with your friends, stay out in the, in the, in the foyer uh, mm -hmm. there, you know, before you actually enter in and hit the uh, holy water font. Uh, we, you know, the idea of, right. of reverence has been lost. The mysterium, as Cardinal Mueller would say, has been lost. And, and so we have to, to, right. to basically regain that. Um, but I think it's all three right. reasons, Andrew. Uh, it, it, it seems to me um, that when you combine it, it's like the trifecta right. Right. Of, of, you know, the perfect storm. Well, I always think in some ways, and I was that before, in some ways, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming out of Vatican II, to some degree, there was this increased emphasis in the meal aspect of it, I think, and sometimes the sacrificial aspect got lost. And, and of course, when people are having a meal, it's much more conviviality. It's much more, you know, in a sense, people coming together. So I think you get that effect. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you actually understand what Jesus meant in the Holy Eucharist, what anamnesis really means, the reliving, what Jesus' prophetic actions mm -hmm. really mean at the Last Supper, I mean, it's so clear the sacrificial aspect is uh, the aspect. Uh, you know, uh, the supper, in, in a way, is almost incidental to the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, at the same time, somehow the supper got pulled out 
as you know the the primary thing with the sacrifice being incidental right. and, and that is simply not Jesus's priority mm -hmm. you can see that now what wound up happening I, I think is that people you know Paul sometimes refers to it as the meal uh, in his letters or something of that nature and so people have taken this word and, and, and you know almost exaggerated it to the point where uh, implying that Paul might be not taking the sacrificial, the real presence of Christ there, uh, body, blood, soul, and divinity of, of Jesus seriously. And mm -hmm. nothing could be further from the truth. How could Paul turn around and say in the next two lines mm -hmm. that, you know, if you receive, you know, the Holy right. Eucharist, uh, you know, uh, unworthily, you know, you, you, you take it uh, uh, under your condemnation. And how would you say in the next breath, uh, some of you are sick and the reason is, is because you're doing, you're receiving unworthily. Well, you know, are you kidding me Paul as no you know he, he cites the real presence mm -hmm. as a matter of fact it's various times right. so the, the idea that somehow the early church was looking at this more as a supper rather than as a sacrifice right. and by the second century the sacrificial terminology has already come out uh, again mm -hmm. and and what's m very interesting you know the people make a lot out of the idea of well the early church used presbyters they didn't use priests that means you know that there's some distance uh, uh, from the, the sacrificial mm -hmm. aspect of the sacrament nothing could be further from the truth the reason that the, the, that the early church first uses they refer to priests as prophets so mm -hmm. you know Paul is talking about the list of charisms and he says first there's the apostles then there's the prophetes, there's the prophets. But the prophets are like people who have the gift of, of uh, uh, the prophetic capacity to, to collapse time uh, through the anamnesis, the mm. reliving of the sacrament that Jesus is talking about. And that prophetic gift is what's precisely referred to. These are the people that are doing the sacrifice. Oh. Later, Paul calls them presbyters, mm -hmm. and the reason that he does is because he doesn't want to con con uh, confuse the issue. He doesn't want to cause confusion with the Jewish priesthood, and, and the Jewish priesthood is a very different kind of priesthood from the high priesthood of Christ, as is clear from the letter to the Hebrews, which is trying to establish this assiduously. Mm -hmm. So now we've got this other aspect there uh, of, you know, of trying to, to, to stay away from the Jewish priesthood, but at the same time uh, refer to the priesthood of Christ. And then finally, by the time you get to the second century, as this thing mm -hmm. wears off, the Christian church has been thrown out of the synagogue, etc. And once that happens, the, the idea of the priestly terminology comes back in. But why does it come back in? Because it's commensurate with the sacrificial aspect of the sacrament, the real presence of Jesus, body, soul, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the whole reason for it. But again, okay. as, as you pointed out, Doug, yeah, we've we've lost uh, that that dimension, and mm -hmm. and uh, I think a lot of theologians have done harm, uh, trying to make a primary aspect from the supper right. rather than the sacrificial real presence of Christ is the primary thing, as Jesus makes clear in John six, and then the supper is the second uh, dimension, uh, you know, where we receive together right. in holy communion as in the communion of saints that's held together by the mystical body of Christ as St. Paul makes clear. Okay, let's uh, try and squeeze in another question here. Dear sure. Father Spitzer, on a previous show you answered a question about fallen angels that implied they could reject God after having attained the beatific vision. This is impossible. Like Adam and huh? Eve, they, this, is, this is what this gentleman's saying. This oh. Like Adam and Eve, they were created with sanctifying grace, but were subject to a test before coming into the fullness of the vision of God. Frank Sheed in his Theology for Beginners explains it very simply. Your comment, this is Richard. So the previous show, you answered a question about fallen angels that implied they could reject God after having attained the beatific vision. 
I simply, um, uh, indic well, if I did imply that, I apologize for that. Okay. But I, I don't think I did. I mm. just implied that fallen angels are angels. Mm. And uh, they were made as angels, and they were made with a completely, uh, um, what I would call, uh, 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 close to uh, uh, what I would call a dimensionless um, uh, temporal um, view mm -hmm. of um, of, uh, of eternity, so th their freedom is a very, very enhanced freedom. Mm -hmm. And so when they make uh, their decision vis-a-vis -vis God, they're making it for uh, an eternity. There's mm -hmm. no turning back from it. Okay. And so did what did the angels see? I, you know, frankly, I, I, I don't you know, know how the angels were created, but I know they were created mm -hmm. with an angelic apperception of what the, um, of, right. of what, um, uh, you know, heaven would be like and what hell would be like. Well, they clearly rejected something, you know, right, obviously. They clearly right. rejected something and they rejected it definitively right. and they rejected it in a dimensionless temporal way, right. which means they rejected it forever. And so that's what I meant to say. Right. And so uh, if if uh, if I've implied something different, I don't know. But um, right. you know, uh, thank you for the comment. Right. We clarified it. <laughs> One quick question more along this uh, topic, uh, dear Father Spitzer. How did Satan, who was once a pure, obedient, loving angel, become so ugly, cruel, and evil? I can see how a person can get that way, but an angel seems more loving, far from evil. Is it just from pride? Pride, appreciate you, Karen. Yeah, uh, Karen, I would just say obedient. Um, that is the, the question. Mm -hmm. uh, was Satan ever obedient? Because remember, uh, again, we're dealing with the dimensionless t uh, temporality. We're dealing with, you know, to say, uh, angels don't have uh, transtemporality in the sense of God. Uh, you can only have one truly transtemporal being, and there's a whole proof of that, and that's God alone. But the angels do have a very special, you know, uh, apperception and, and freedom, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's, that's free from some dimensions of, of temporality, mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe free from all dimensions of temporality in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. But um, whether Satan was obedient in that condition is, is difficult to, to, to say. Mm -hmm. um, uh, was he, the moment he was created with his angelic vision of what heaven and hell were like, um, was he, um, uh, was he obedient? I don't know. I would think that his free act was almost instantaneously, mm -hmm. I want to be me. You know, and I know that in Revelation it's portrayed in a temporalized way, right? Um, uh, you know, in other words, there's there's a big battle going on. But remember that temporalized way and the battle between uh, uh, Satan and and, and Michael. Mm -hmm. um, that's already after Satan has fallen. So um, how you know what what exactly happened? Um, you know, I'm not sure that he was obedient uh, mm -hmm. previously because there may not have mm -hmm. been a previously in our sense of the word. Right. So okay. I, I don't know what that f r free action was. The, the person I think who penetrates it uh, the, 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 the most deeply is St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. and I have to say uh, some of the treatise on angels is, is the most difficult for me by far. Mm -hmm. And it shows why his intellect is quite superior to my own. But I, I do think that uh, some people have written um, uh, some very good uh, commentaries right. on his uh, treatise on the angels. But uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, for me to say. But right. in, in short, Karen, I'm not sure that Satan was ever obedient. I think in his own reflexive uh, you know, transtemporalized right. freedom, mm -hmm. if I can call it that, I think he was probably disobedient almost at an instant right. that he decided on his, his ego before uh, surrender to God almost at an instant. Okay, with that instant, we shall uh, take a break here with Father <laughs> Spitzer. Much more ahead. We'll have a, maybe one or more questions still ahead, and then we'll get into our topic talking about where we've been with the church and where we're going. Hope you stay with us.
And thank you so much for staying with us right here in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe. Our show topic, Where Have We Come From and Where Are We Going? Talking about the church. Of course, uh, we rejoined Father Spitzer. We were talking about some uh, questions recently. And of course, one of the things besides the Amazonian Synod that just concluded, we had also a couple of canonizations, especially one that was very important to many in the United States involved actually EWTN, which was involved with some of the people who had healings becoming oh, yeah. uh, involved with it. But uh, there's uh, Cardinal Newman said that God, let's see, yeah, we got it on there. The John Henry Cardinal Newman, even though that looks like Neumann, but it's Newman, it says yeah. that uh, God has given all of us a mission, this is a great prayer, to be accomplished during our life. What if we don't accomplish it? I'm sure that whatever I was supposed to do did not get done. I'm now in my seven, I'm sure that's not true. And as I look back, I realize I've failed in everything, my marriage, relationships, etc. I don't see that I have done anything positive or worthwhile in my life. So what if we failed in our quote unquote assignment from God? Is there any hope regards Terry? It's being tough on herself. Terry, that's a good question, mm -hmm. but the quick answer is yes, there's always hope because you know all you have to do is just decide that you're going to get on the road to heaven. You're going to start praying. Seventy years old, you're you're you know you're spring chicken, mm -hmm. you know ready. You can establish a relationship with God. You can try to get to, to mass as as often as you as you uh, can. You also can uh, try to get to confession and, and 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 stay within the sacramental life. You can try to do some good things for people. And so we are not enslaved by our past. That's the whole point why Christ came. He said, look, you know, even people, you know, like tax collectors, uh, you know, who, who truly in, in, in the uh, first century Jewish mindset, uh, tax collectors are next to mass murderers and mm -hmm. in serious sinners. And who does Jesus go out to? The tax collectors. Who does he invite them? Uh, who does he invite to his house? Tax collectors. Who does he bring into his own close apostleship. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector. Who does he call down from the tree? Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no one of us is enslaved to our past. Mm -hmm. we, we could have a past like St. Augustine's. And by the way, that was not a pretty past. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, it has its moments of grace in it where he's being called by God closer and closer. But let's face facts. Uh, Augustine got on the road a little bit late in life, but boy, did he get on the road uh, really rapidly. Rapidly. But the, the, my point is, we're never enslaved to our mm -hmm. past. Even Jesus says, even if you come at the ninth hour, that's the very last hour of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, there's about one hour left of the work day out of about ten. Mm -hmm. And if you come at that hour, uh, still, says uh, uh, Jesus, you're okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you can come right in the fold and you're going to get the same pay as everybody else. So my advice to you, Terry, is stay on the road, uh, get to confession, um, try to uh, uh, receive the Holy Eucharist as often as you mm -hmm. can and start, you know, saying uh, your prayers as best you can and maybe take right. uh, get a book like the Notre Dame prayer book or something of that nature where you have some good comments and prayers first and start praying mm -hmm. from there and then maybe pick up the Magnificat or some other mm -hmm. uh, you know a daily prayer thing where you're mm -hmm. uh, you're attending to your prayer life on a daily basis 70 you know you're ready to start uh, a, a relationship with God do right. not look back at your past failures look to your future and hope right. because God by one single confession can wipe away and absolve all of your sins and and yank you out of the hands of darkness and mm -hmm. bring you into the fullness of his light and it may not feel like you're going right. into the light don't worry about your feelings don't gauge whether or not you're you're on the road by your feelings uh, gauge whether you're there by your actions are you trying to receive Holy Communion faithfully? Are you, do you mm -hmm. get to confession? Are you trying to uh, say some prayers in the morning, in the evening? Are, are you trying your, mm -hmm. your best to stay on the road to do some good things for people? It, okay, Terry, then you're on the road. Irregardless of your, regardless of your feelings, you're on the road and just stay on that road. You're going to be fine. God will come into your life and grace you and keep pulling you toward himself. 
Right, very good. Let's talk about, uh, to get through in the last 15 minutes or so, kind of wrap up this mm -hmm. chapter here, uh, volume six mm -hmm. on the Catholic Church. Uh, why do you say, where do we go from here? Life in Christ through the Catholic Church. And uh, are, are we going someplace different than we were before? What did you mean? Well, um, you know, in, um, in, in that particular sense, incredible Catholic, I, I, it was kind of a transition point. Mm -hmm. And once you sort of make up your mind that Jesus really did start the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and he not only started the Catholic Church, but he meant to do that through the agency of Peter. Mm -hmm. And he gave Peter this power, and he gave a promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And he did really give us the gift of himself in the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And he did really give his apostles and their successors the power to forgive sins. If he really did all of that, including inspiring the church leadership mm -hmm. to have a proper interpretation of the scriptures, a proper interpretation of what he meant and intended uh, in his words. If that's really the case, then the church is the vehicle for salvation. Mm -hmm. Now it's, you're at a critical point. When you make that decision, hey, the church really is the vehicle, then you got to, first thing you got to do is say, these sacraments, I might have been going to the sacraments all these years, and I, I was just sort of I don't know, in an oblivion almost. Mm -hmm. I, I was just kind of going through the motions. motions I was right. going through the actions. Mm -hmm. Forget about that past. That was bad. You, you, not bad, but it's, it's just, it, it wasn't a, a good way of interacting with the second. Now look at the sacraments anew. Start with your baptism. Do you realize the gift that you were given, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of incorporation to the very mystical body of Christ? Do you realize the graces that you were given, the protection you were given against Satan and, 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 and evil? Do you realize the, the, the gift of light and inspiration that you were given at, the, at, at, at your baptism? Mm -hmm. Of course you're totally new. But the point is, yeah, you might, well, I was baptized as a baby. True enough. Mm -hmm. But the, in order for that grace that you have been given to work, you have to kind of recognize it and then cooperate with it. So the, the, the first thing you want to do is recognize, I have been given these gifts of baptism. And, and, and if, I, if I could, uh, could I encourage you to go to CredibleCatholic.com. Mm -hmm. And this time, uh, it, it, go to Volume 9 first. Volume 9, I, I, I'm sorry, click on the big book. So go to CredibleCatholic.com. Click on the big book, bu big book, and then go to Volume Nine. Mm -hmm. When you're in Volume Nine, that's the one on the Holy Eucharist and the Mass. Just take your time and just try to appreciate what this gift of the Holy Eucharist is like. Right. Then, secondly, go to Volume Ten. So again, you click on the big CredibleCatholic.com. Click on the big book. Now go to Volume Ten. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the other sacraments, but the ones I want you to concentrate on are baptism and confirmation and the sacrament of the sick. Mm -hmm. Concentrate on that uh, just for the time being and just work on that for a, a while because when you see the graces there that you, you can cooperate with and then the, the, the graces that, that uh, you know, are guiding your life, all the gifts you've been given through the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. you, you just want to take out a little piece of paper and just say, how do I want to cooperate with my gift of mm -hmm. baptism? How do I want to cooperate with this immense gift of the Holy Eucharist? How do I want to cooperate with this immense gift of, of confirmation that I, I have been given? And later on, we talk about the sacrament of the sick. You know, if I get sick or something happens, how would I want to cooperate with, with the sacrament of the sick? Then what I would do is flip over to volume 11, which is the one on, on Catholic marriage. Mm -hmm. and, and there it's a whole volume just on marriage. And the reason is, is because the Catholic Church's view of marriage, the Catholic Church's view of love, the Catholic Church's view of, 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 of a family and, and of children is just so spectacularly rich because it's Jesus' interpretation of family and children and love and, and sacrifice and, and, and the sacrament of marriage that he intended and tried to establish. And it, it, it really
really is a reflection. There's so much there. But if we actually cooperate with the grace of marriage that's been given, uh, obviously it's going to come fully alive. And for those who have really a, a, a gift and a call maybe that they're perceiving uh, to come to, to holy orders, I would then go back to volume 10 and read the uh, section there on holy orders and, and look at perhaps discerning that mm -hmm. gift uh, as well. But these are these these seven sacraments are just unbelievable. But uh, again, it, it, it requires us to know what right. we got. You know, I mean, I mean, I have to tell you, for 30 years, I just sat there in an oblivion about how important my baptism was. Mm. And here I am on the verge of ordination. I'm in a, a, a baptism and confirmation class um, with uh, Dr. Becker, uh, Father Becker, and uh, it suddenly occurs to me, oh my gosh. I've taken all of this stuff for granted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, of course, I didn't take the gift of the Holy Spirit for granted. I knew that. Mm -hmm. I knew I was inspired and protected and guided. I had no, I, no doubt about that. But right. everything else I'd almost taken for granted. And so it was really almost a recognition. I have been given so much, and I have given so little things. I've been given so much and cooperated with so little. And then I began mm -hmm. to look how, you know, the Eucharist, of course, I, in my uh, priestly training, just, mm -hmm. just reading all of the, the elements of the Holy Eucharist and what Jesus' intention was, it really enriched me. But again, I would go back to that volume nine. The Mass is so rich. And I, I tried to summarize, you know, Jungmann's whole book on the Mass in about, you know, 30 pages. Right. I, that's impossible to do. Uh, but it, it, basically, I, I think I've got the, the elements there and how it traces back to the first century. And, and so take a look at that mm -hmm. when you start looking at it all. And if you're married already, uh, my one thing would be go to that chapter, volume 11, on marriage because it is so rich. Right. And, and there's so much these sacraments. So once you make a decision for the church, I mean, the next thing you, you're doing is you're entering into the sacraments. A lot of people say, well, I've got a prayer life. Well, prayer is good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But prayer complements the sacraments, and the sacraments complement prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, this thing, I mean, the sacraments are the first power. That's the power, the power of baptism. What, it just makes mm -hmm. your prayer life come alive, right? You're, you're praying in and through the mm -hmm. grace of the Holy Spirit given to you at baptism, right? And the same thing with entering into uh, the mystical body with all these mm -hmm. new charisms and confirmation in your sacrament of confirmation and, and, and just boom, making your prayer life come alive. It's a whole different deal mm -hmm. after your confirmation. And again, uh, I, I have a whole, you know, if you look right. at volume 12 on prayer, that's great. Uh, do that. But remember, volume 9, 10, and 11 precede mm -hmm. volume 12. So you want the sacraments to get the sense of what these graces are for. Then, of course, uh, you, you go to volume 12 on prayer. Then mm -hmm. adoration is going to make sense to you. A and then you know, uh, uh, seeing uh, your prayer in relationship mm -hmm. to the Holy Eucharist is going to make sense to you. A and then the devotions are, are going to make sense to you. Because what the, the church's symbolism, the church's whole architecture, the church's music mm -hmm. is built around the, the Holy Eucharist and the sacrament of, of, of uh, reconciliation, the sacrament of right. confirmation, the sacrament of, of baptism. So it's, it's just built around so, it. And, right. and everything makes sense in light of the sacraments. Right. Right, so we're going to have a library there with all these volumes here that everybody's got to <laughs> keep track of here. But uh, but uh, let me ask you, uh, near as we wrap up yeah. near the end here, because I wanted to see if we can finish, <laughs> is you talk about spiritual conversion and then there's something called moral conversion. Yeah. What's the difference between those two for somebody? Yeah, spiritual conversion. See, there's, there's three levels of conversion. There's intellectual conversion where a believer actually says, I not only have enough evidence, but I have enough desire and wills, right? I, I, it's not just getting evidence for God, the soul, and Jesus, and, and the church. That's important because faith and reason, what this show is all about, come together. But more than that, 
uh, we also um, want, uh, you know, to, to have that desire, right, for God that is so strong that when the evidence is in place, we want God literally to suck us into the church, into the sacraments, into prayer, so that we will no longer have restless hearts, but our hearts will find our rest in Him. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is relationship uh, with God. I'll call it spiritual conversion through the sacraments, through prayer, through, uh, you know, uh, uh, fidelity uh, to His teaching. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that we want, and that's called spiritual conversion. So intellectual conversion gives me the evidence and, and, and frees my desire and will. Spiritual conversion, I move then to a relationship with Christ through the sacraments, through prayer, and, mm -hmm. and through a surrender to His Word and His will. Mm -hmm. And then finally, of course, there's moral conversion. And moral conversion means that I am going to enter earnestly into this spiritual struggle between cosmic good and cosmic evil, between God and Satan. I'm going to have to uh, enter into that. And believe me, th this is the, you know, you, you need that relationship with God. Mm -hmm. You need that intellectual conviction. You want to build your moral conversion on your intellectual conversion, your spiritual conversion, mm -hmm. because that's going to be really helpful when you're dealing with the devil. You've mm -hmm. got to deal with his temptations. You've got to deal with his deceits. You're going to have to deal uh, with your freedom. You're going to have to deal with his accusations. And these things, you, you know, you have have to do it through the teaching of, of, of Jesus. You, you, you can't do it by yourself. You, you can't say, I'll make up my mind what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. We need help because we are rationalizers. Mm -hmm. You've heard my principle, uh, Spitzerian principle of infinite rationalization before. Give me five minutes. I can tell you anything is right. <laughs> but if I'm on my own mm -hmm. and sola scriptura, what a joke that is. I mean, the idea that we're going to read scripture and get the proper interpretation when we don't even know enough hermeneutics to argue our way out of a paper bag, let alone have enough freedom of the will and enough resistance to temptation and enough resistance to rationalization to free ourselves from inauthenticity. You think you're going to read the scripture and just come out with a purity of interpretation? Well, I can't. I mean, you're way beyond me if you can do that. I mean, I, I'm just an infant compared to your angelic capacity. But I'll tell you one thing. I need the church and I need Jesus Christ, and I need the Holy Spirit, and I need them all, you know, mm -hmm. through the sacramental gifts that I have been given, then I, I got to surrender. There's only one thing I can do. I got to surrender to what Jesus said is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, it's not going to be instantaneously apparent to me in the scripture. So I'm going to have to turn to the church so that I can reconcile, right? There's passages that seem to disagree with each other. There are passages which have 40 different interpretations interpretations of a single passage of scripture uh, you know theologians who are smarter than me how you know uh, they can't figure it out I'm going to the church that's where Jesus promised the charism to Peter that's where the gift of the Holy Spirit is I got to surrender to the teaching of Jesus in the church that's the first thing so a moral conversion the idea I'm going to go into moral conversion without the church without church teaching without mm -hmm. the sacraments without the Holy Spirit helping me uh, directly without an act of surrender mm -hmm. in, in relationship to him and spiritual conversion it's just, for me it would be a joke I, I, I just can't be done mm -hmm. uh, I got to have all of it. And so, you know, in all humility, since I'm not, uh, you know, the enlightened man, uh, I, I am but, as, as Jesus would say, a, a, a humble servant. You know, I've just done what I, I've tried to do. I, I, I just got to be obedient. That's mm -hmm. all there is to it. I need the sacraments. That's all there is to it. I got to look uh, to what I cannot figure out for myself. And even if I don't like it, if I go, this doesn't sound right to me, mm -hmm. but if the church says it, Okay, you know, I mean, if and especially if it's the magisterium, if it's taught right as 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 extraordinary magisterium, I'm going with it, and and I've I've got to believe, and I figured that's going to get me not only to heaven, it's going to help me to get to the truth about myself, it's going to free me from myself, it's going to help me in the spiritual battle against evil, and when all of these things are done at the end of the day, I hope I can help other people uh, to get into heaven as well, and so that that is. And the point um, I'm trying to, uh, to, 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 to make with my life, point. and I would say uh, moral conversion is a battle. It's a daily battle. Uh, 
you're going to have to resist temptation. And believe me, you know, the, the devil's just going to come to you, especially when you're tired and you're stressed right. and you're just already Absolutely. beaten down. Then he's going to come with you extra temptations, everything else. And, and it's a battle. But right. you know what? Hang in there because you're not alone. You're right. with the whole communion of saints. If you're receiving the Holy Eucharist, take the strength. Keep fighting and keep in that, you know, uh, uh, trying to transform your, right. your, your, uh, your life to resist temptation. And I've got some, some uh, techniques for helping right. you to resist temptation uh, in that book. But uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola has uh, what he calls the examine right. prayer. And that's a topic for well, another is, day. Right. That this exam is, prayer is powerful. That's the end of this round here, unfortunately, <laughs> in this part of the spiritual battle. We'll have to wrap it up today so you can give us a... Uh, give us your blessing on the way out the door there, Father. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Please bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And in his love, may he vouchsafe you through the sacraments, through the church, through your prayer, and through your earnest efforts at surrender and, and prayer to come into the fullness of his light for all eternity and to use the gifts that you now have to lead others to do so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good. Thank you so much for all the pictures. We shall see you next time. We're going to have some Q&A. And that all wraps right. up, of course, EWTN's coverage of Father Spitzer's universe. Don't forget all those wonderful uh, books pictured on the screen. Father Spitzer's materials through the EWTN religious catalog. Look for also our my bookmark interview coming up with Jennifer Roback Morse on her book having to do with the sexual state. A very interesting read. That's coming up this Sunday, and we shall see you next time. Look for us at the very busy intersection of faith and reason. Bring both of them with you. You'll need them. See you next time.